Over in Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 10, really one verse that I want to concentrate on, though I'll be reading more than that in a little bit. Uh, but I want to start out in Nehemiah chapter 8 uh, this tonight. And uh, if I remember what kind of day it is, whether it's morning or night, you know what I mean? So Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 10. And a very familiar passage of Scripture. I believe all of you could probably quote at least a portion of it by heart, right? And uh, But let us, let us look at... Uh, the situation going on here for uh, Nehemiah. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Nehemiah 18 says, Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared, for this day is holy unto our God, or unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And so uh, that's what I'll be preaching on for tonight. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray and ask you to help me as, uh, try to communicate this message to the best of my ability. And I uh, pray that you will give something here tonight that uh, ought to cause us some excitement and some joy. Lord, I believe that it's joy in serving Jesus. I believe that, uh, Lord, there's nothing greater than uh, the joy of our salvation. Where you said, draw waters out of the well of salvation over in Isaiah chapter 12. Uh, Lord, help us to make it real and personal and understand where our joy comes from and what it's rooted in. And may we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, you know, when we sit here and we think about this passage of Scripture, we, we look at the word strength, and it's one of these words that can mean one thing or another. You know, you look at somebody I used to uh, admire when we were in, in uh, middle school, I used to like to do arm wrestling. I thought I was good for a short period of time, and then I found out that I wasn't as good as what I thought I was, and I got kept getting beat. But, you know, when somebody is winning over and over again in the arm wrestling competitions, you say, that person's strong. Uh, my friend Cody Crane up in Michigan, he has uh, signed up for one of these weight power lifting contests, and he was telling me how he could push 475 pounds off of his chest. Well, to me, that's strength, you know, and I don't plan on doing that, so you don't have anything to worry about, but 475 pounds pressed off of your chest, that is a lot of weight. Now, I know that there's other people that could do more than that, but that impresses me a little bit, you know. And, uh, but it's nothing in comparison to the strength or the fierceness of a lion. You know, you see a lion out on the, out on the desert or out in the uh, uh, wilderness, whatever, you know, out in the Africa, wherever they are, over in, in the, that part of the world. And uh, those animals have incredible strength. I wouldn't want to get into the, the, there are people that are just, to me, out of their mind who jump into the cages of these beasts knowing that they could tear you to shreds in just a split second like that. Uh, the jaws of an alligator are just really tremendous, the strength that they have. Uh, even more than a bulldog, I believe. Or a gorilla, you know, you think about the strength of these big monstrosity of beasts, they, they can really tear apart anything in just a matter of moments. So they have incredible strength. And, uh, you know, what I found out is strength is relative. It's really based upon what you, what you could consider to be strong or strength or where it comes from. It looks, uh, looks like several different things. You know, whether it's the strength of somebody pushing something off of their chest or the strength of a lion, or maybe as uh, my friend Dustin Duke would do, is study the tensile strength of bridges and how much weight did it get up hold before it cracks and crumbles underneath the elements and the stress of vehicles traveling on top of it. It's, it's all very relative is what I'm trying to say. You know, as strong as a father is, a mother's tenderness is strength because that's the first place that kids run to. And uh, I believe that they find strength in this, that tenderness of their mother's arms. And um, we got to understand what, what we're trying to understand about strength. Where does it come from? What is it based on? Sarah and I were able to get Elijah uh, a front-end loader for, for Resurrection Sunday. We're one of those remote control front loaders, you know. He's all about remote control cars at this point. And uh, I was too at this age. And uh, when he opened it, we failed to get him batteries. He still doesn't have batteries for that thing. 
You know, it's a lot of fun when it has batteries, but when you don't have batteries in there, it's not a lot of fun. And, you know, he, he tried for a little bit, but it's a battery that gives it the strength to be able to move it and to put it into motion. It can't do anything without those batteries, and there's the power of the batteries as well. Nehemiah uh, says these all familiar words, and, and what I'm trying to get to around is this. Walls is one thing. Uh, Enemies can penetrate, they can go over, they can go through walls, they can blow walls up. The walls are only so good. It's, it's, it's not a matter of what they can do, it's not a matter of the walls, it's not a matter of the industries, it's not a matter of the work, it's not a matter of what they can do or uh, things that they accomplish if they would just put their minds to it. It's not in anything that man can do in and of itself. The strength that I believe that Nehemiah is trying to draw the attention of the Israelites to is the strength that we can find in the Lord Himself. You know, if we don't have the Lord on our side, it's, everything else is in vain. The Bible says in Psalm 127, it says, except the watchman <laughs> watches, you know, it's, it's all in vain. Except that, you know, the Lord built the house, it's, they labor in vain to build it, is what He says. And so, it's this idea of the Lord being the source, the strength, the, the author of their, their strength. I've messed up in my life in so many occasions, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. I can't even, I don't even want to think back on all the times that I've messed up and all the foolish, foolish things that I've done over the course of the years. And Israel was kind of in that same condition. They, they, they were put into captivity for a reason. They, they didn't have a whole lot to be proud of. And you look over that portion of their history where they looked back and the things that caused them to go into captivity, the idolatry, the refusing to hear God's word, their hardness of their heart, the stiffening of their neck, their turning away from God, the living in sin, living in idolatry, living in uh, all kinds of wickedness, and yet they refused. And God said, enough is enough, and I want to deliver you up to the Babylonians, and they are just going to deal with you. That is how I want to deal with this. And of course, we, we understand along with that is also the, the Sabbaths that they have neglected, and they were judged for those 70 years. Can I tell you this? Just to have that pressure, that weight of sin, and that weight of the burdens that you're carrying, the weight maybe if we think about the Israelites as they're going down, and, and yes, praise the Lord, as Cyrus allowed them to go down and said, as many as you will, go down, I'll, I'll let you go free. I'm not going to hold you under bondage. And you can go down and rebuild your temple. But can I tell you, to, to go down there and try to rebuild out of nothing, that would have been a great weight. And they did go to work and they did begin to build. And uh, It was on Nehemiah's heart to go ahead and rebuild the walls of the temple. It was in Ezra's heart to see that the, the temple was reconstructed. So they have the, the temple reconstructed. They have the walls that were built in 52 days. That was a miracle all in and of itself. But they are still carrying something great, something heavy, something very burdensome that only the Lord can relieve them of, to find acceptance, to find joy, to find happiness in God. They had probably what most people would think that would get them started out right. They, they have their houses built, they have the walls built, they have the, they have the superstructure, they have the infrastructure, they have the the temple, but what they need is that re, re, reuniting or reigniting of, of spiritual life within them. You guys following me tonight? <laughs> All right. And that is what they're missing. Nehemiah says strength is not what we can do. The strength is having God back in this house. The strength is having God to be a part of our work. The strength is to once again stand in the presence of God and find His favor upon 
the way that we're living, that we might be as people once again, that He might be satisfied to be our God and we to be His people, that is our strength to find that acceptance and joy in, in Him. And so that's what I want you to think about when it comes to this idea of joy or this joy of the Lord being our strength. Chuck Swindoll, he said this, uh, he says that the people were well-ordered, well-defended, well-governed, and there was still something missing. Nehemiah sensed the spiritual vacuum as did the people. A timeless truth emerges from all this, and there's no use having a well-constructed superstructure if there's little or no life inside of it. And so the people, as they would build the walls and see their homes built, and they were seemed to be setting out strong and setting out right once again to, 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 to be God's people, what they really desired more than anything else was this relationship with God. They didn't want no more of what they had. Dwelling in the land of Persia. Wondering what their, what their identity is. Wondering where they belong. Wondering who are they supposed to do? Who are they supposed to be? Who are they supposed to serve? How are they supposed to serve? They wanted the presence of God like it used to be in the days of David, when the days uh, where David would go out and he would bring the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem. He wanted it to be as in the days of Solomon. And you remember as they built the temple, some of them were weeping in their heart because it wasn't anything in comparison to Solomon's temple. But that's what they wanted. They want something to be excited about, to be joyful about. They wanted those days back, the good old days. You know what I'm saying? And so they had worked for them. They had worked hard for God. They understood that when Nehemiah called and they told him everything that God put within his heart, they put their hands to the plow, they began to work, but more than just do the hand of work and say, oh, I understand, yes, God called you to do this. Yes, we see this happening here. Yes, we see that happening there. But more than that, they wanted to be able to worship their God once again. They wanted God to be a part of their everyday lives. Isn't that what you want? To have God a part of your everyday life. They wanted to know who He is and, and, and to be desired of God once again. They wanted God to speak to them again like they did in former times. And so something happens here. The Word of God penetrates their hearts and they're able to experience real, true, genuine joy. And uh, that's what I want to look at tonight. I want us to see the joy, how to get it and how to keep it and how to be excited about it. I want us to be excited every time that we come into the house of God. And, and, and really that's what I want us to get wrap our minds around. And first we see the joy and unity. So let us look at verse 1 here in our, our text. Nehemiah 8, 1, it says, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street and was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to the, bring the book of the law of Moses, was to the Lord had commanded to Israel. And it seems interesting in and of itself. So all the people were gathering together. All is one heart and one mind and one faith and one spirit and one God. Uh, all in, in unison together to, to be God's people once again. You know, formerly as we look back and some of the things that were going on in the book of Nehemiah, it wasn't always easy. In fact, we find that the nobles were times were causing trouble. Their hearts were fainting. Seems like there could have been some division, some fracture with, within the nation of Israel himself, between the people that are there. At some points, it said that the, the, the people were working, but the nobles didn't want to have anything to do with the work. There was trouble with the enemy without. There was trouble within. There was all kinds of trouble everywhere that you look. But all of a sudden after they emerged from the work when people said that this could not be done and God showed the, the, His power and showed that He could bring it about. All of a sudden now they were able to emerge as one mind, one heart to be the people of God once again. Isn't that what God wants? Jesus prayed over in John chapter 17 as He prays unto the Father. He prays that, that we might be one even as He is one with the Father. That's what He wants. In John 17, 21 through 23, it says that they may be one as Thou, Father, art in me and I in Thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that Thou hast sent me and the glory which Thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one, and I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, 
that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. It's an amazing thing to think that God would love us even as he loved Christ. He says, but they might know that you love them as much as you love me. Lord, I pray that you be with them. And I pray that they're one. That in their unity and in their love, that it might be a witness to the world that there is a real and living God. Over the book of 1 Corinthians, and of course, uh, uh, I talked about this a little bit this morning. The struggle was that they, they were not acting as one church. Of course, we remember the divisions and things that were going on, but he calls them to unity. Paul calls them to unity. He begins to deal with them in some particular ways, and he says, you, listen, you, got, you are one body. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, you all uh, are different parts of the members of the body and, and, and you're to function as a body and you're to have the same goal and the same mission to be working together to the same ends. And that is how you're supposed to function as a church with that spiritual powerhouse within you, the Holy Spirit that's indwelling this uh, Christ who lives inside of you, the indwelling Christ, the uh, infilling or the, the filling of the Holy Spirit that you might accomplish God's work and will in this world. And yes, that stands as a witness of God in us. You come to a church body and you see that there's unity, you see that there's joy. I, I, t I tell you, when I went out to that uh, church in California for that one pastor's conference and I was there for a short space of time, I... Uh, I never thought I would like anything about California, to be honest with you. You know, you hear of everything that's going on out there, and it just doesn't seem like a place to be. But you see the church, it was alive, and it was active, and people were coming home from a 40-day, 40 40-hour 40 work week, and sometimes more than that, and they would get on their buses, and they would pick up uh, these people on these great big buses and drive around and bring them in. And you would sit down and talk and say, hey, aren't you tired? So, well, a little bit, but we're excited. I mean, this, don't, can't you see all these people that are coming in the bus? You see the guys at the crosswalk directing the traffic in and out, and you see the people at the door standing, inviting, and handing out the bulletins. You see the, 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 the Sunday school workers, the children's workers, and these people, everybody's involved in the work. Some guys are out front, and they're greeting the visitors and say, hey, can you fill this out, and can I give you this $5, uh, I think it was a Dunkin' Donuts card. It might have been the Starbucks. I don't know. I could care less. I like my home coffee. But they were excited. And you could sense that there's something going on. You come into a church where there's this unity and you sense the Holy Spirit. You see the, uh, it seems to be alive and there's this joy of God. Ephesians 4 verse 3 says, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. This is what Paul talks about. This is what Jesus talks about. This is what's going on in the book of Nehemiah. And praise the Lord for that. I'm glad that we can have unity. They gathered together into the water gate. You know, I thought a water gate was something that happened way back in the 60s or 70s, right? Uh, Richard Nixon. They gathered together at the water gate. It's believed that this place was close to the Gihon Springs. You know, of course, if it's going to be called the water gate, you hope that there's going to be water involved, right? Or it'd be a purposeless name. But it's close to the guy on Springs, and uh, they thought maybe that uh, this might be where the city can go in and access water and bring it into their homes, or maybe it was a palace gate, or maybe it was for accessing the water for the temple to be used for purification or whatever the course may be. But they're gathering together unto this, this one gate, this one body, this one mind, and one purpose. And it says, and they... What do they want? They spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses. The people took the initiative in and of themselves and they said, Ezra, you need to get the book. Ezra, you need to bring out the Bible. Ezra, we need the Word of God. It's interesting when we look back in the Old Testament, go back to Deuteronomy chapter 31. 
Deuteronomy 31. And it says in verse 10, Deuteronomy 31, 10, it says, And Moses commanded them, saying at the end of every seven years, in the solemn, solemnity of the year of release, in the Feast of Tabernacles. And by the way, the Feast of Tabernacles is going to be the Feast of Booths that we'll see pointed out in the book of Nehemiah. It says, In the Feast of the Tabernacles, when all Israel has come to appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose... Thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Gather the people together, the men, the women, the children, and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear and that they may learn and fear the Lord your God and observe to do all the words of this law. And it says in verse 13, And that their children which have not known anything may, f may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land, whether you go over Jordan to possess it. And so he, he, Moses is speaking, of course, to the nation of Israel. He gives them this instruction. He says, when you go over into the inheritance that God gives you, what you need to do is gather together, assemble together in the place where God desires to set His name. The place where you're going to dwell and you're not going to move around anymore. This will be your permanent dwelling. And in this place, I want you to get together and I want you to read the Law of Moses, the first five books of the Bible. And I want you to do it in such a sense that you, you're speaking not only to the, to the men and women. This is not going to be some sort of formal assembly where you just separate yourselves. Women are going to be on one side. The men's going to be on the other side. And, you know, the children are going to be somewhere else. Or they're going to be with the women on the other side and uh, that kind of thing. No, you're all going to be together. The stranger is going to be in the presence as well. And I want you to explain it in a way in which they can comprehend and understand that they may know how to behave themselves in the land that I give you. As Paul would say, that you might be able to know how to behave yourself in the house of God. You need to read the law of God. There was this strong desire to hear from God once again. They spake unto Ezra. They wanted to hear from God. They wanted to hear His voice. They wanted to know Him in a personal way. They didn't want no more of this vain religious stuff. They didn't want any more of what they had in Persia. They didn't want any more of what they had in Babylon. They wanted what their fathers had. They wanted to hear the voice of God. They wanted to see His presence. They wanted the Shekinah glory. Folks, I think you know what I'm saying. They wanted something real and living. They wanted to be excited about God once again. They were appearing as one man that, that God might be with them where they were. And it was in the place where God would set His name and establish His name in this one place. It's almost like they were going back over Jordan once again. It's not the same thing, but it's almost as if they're doing that very thing where they would go back into the promised land and reestablish and just be reunited with the God that they, they had heard about all these years and never knew. It's a re... I don't know how to describe it other than a reunion. And it's a reunion between the people of God and God Himself. So there was this joy in their unity. There was joy in this understanding that's before us. Um... Where did, the, where did the Israelites come from? Of course, Babylon and Persia, right? And how long were they there? Seventy years. Back over the book of Judges, chapter 2, verse 10. The Bible tells us there rose up another generation that knew not God, neither His works. It doesn't take long for people to forget what God has done. They, they can forget it in a matter of 5, 10, 15 years. But can you imagine 70 years in the land of Babylon and Persia? They had grown used to that way of life. In fact, when you read about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and understanding when Nebuchadnezzar built his image, and he told him, he says, and the minute that the sackbut, the flute, the, halt, the psaltery, and all these musical instruments began to play, 
I want you to bow down and worship this golden image. And what happened? All of them bowed except for those three men. And I'm just trying to get that to sink into our heads to show you how saturated with that culture that they were. They had lost sight of what it is to worship God, to know God in such a way that David would have known Him or the way that uh, Samuel would have known Him. It's like they've lost all sense of this relationship of serving in the temple or serving uh, in, in just the, the, the regular ways of life that God might be the center of their, their calendar, the center of their worship, the center of their homes, the center of their way of life. Everything. They had just been so captivated with the world, but they've had enough with the world. They, they didn't want it anymore. They wanted God. So a pulpit was built. This was the most important thing that they could possibly do. It was the most important place for them to possibly be. Some people think that it's more important for them to be at a ball game or someplace else, but this was the most important thing to be. And can I tell you, honestly... When I read over the law of Moses, the first five books of the Bible, I get to reading through Leviticus. It doesn't always appear, appeal to me. When I read through the book of Numbers and it says, and uh, this many thousand people, and, and they offered up this many uh, thousands of gold and silver and uh, oxen and sheep and what have you, it doesn't really enter into my head a whole lot. Why? Because I'm not an Israelite. I'm not a Jew. I don't even comprehend all fully exactly what that means every time that I read through there. I try to re-familiarize myself with it and try to uh, pinpoint it down. But can I tell you, as he's standing on top of this big halter and, and there are thousands of people that are gathered around and he's standing front and center and uh, he opens up the book of the law and all the people stand to their feet and this is where many people where, where they, the preacher gets up and they say, well, now all you people stand to your feet. That's where they get it from. And as he opens up the book, all the people were standing to their feet from the, from the morning until the evening as he begins to read and not one of them lost interest and not one of them uh, just, just yawned and said, oh, this is boring. I'd rather be at my house. Not one of them. They desired it so much. They, Ezra, the priest, Nehemiah knew his place. He it wasn't his responsibility to do what uh, the Levites would do, which is to open the book of the law. Nehemiah wasn't a pastor. But Ezra was, the, a, Ezra was a scribe. He was a ready scribe. He was a priest and he could stand up and he could give the understanding. He had a great number of people that were on the platform with him watching and trying to make sure that everybody had a sense of what was being said. He had some Levites that were here on the platform with him, and then he had some people along the sides, and I'm not going to pronounce their names, okay, because uh, I'll butcher the names. But anyway, they had people on the sides just waiting. If somebody had a question, they could go over to these guys and say, well, uh, Ezra said this, but I don't understand what it means. You know, what, what means the burnt sacrifice or the sin offering or the burnt offering or the peace offering or the Thanksgiving offering? I'm having trouble breaking down these offerings and what they they mean and the Levi would go and they would break it down and explain it in the common vernacular that everybody might have a sense of what's being said. I imagine that not everybody there probably was familiar with Hebrew, the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew language. You know, when Israel was once again establishing themselves as a nation, it's been a long time since I've studied this, but I believe it was Golda Meir who was like the first prime minister. I might be wrong about that. But they had lost all sense of the Hebrew language. And there was somebody there that tried to reconstruct it and reconfigure it and reintroduce it to the people that they might speak in the Hebrew tongue once again. What I'm saying is not everybody would have understood the things that Nehemiah was speaking but he made sure that they could break it down, that they might live it out and have it in their homes and in their lives. Again, they didn't find it draining to learn their history and how God began the nation. 
They didn't find it boring when God called Abraham out of the earth of the Chaldees and he followed him, not knowing where God would bring him, but he brought him into the land of Canaan. They didn't find it boring when he learns about uh, Jacob and uh, wrestling at the river Jabbok. He didn't find it boring to, to think about uh, I, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all their forefathers. None of this. And as they begin to reintroduce these things to the nation of Israel, and Ezra giving a sense of it, you know what they heard? They heard the attributes of God where God had appeared before Moses in the burning bush where he says, I am that I am. Henceforth, my, your fathers haven't known me by this name, Jehovah. But you shall know me by this name. I am that I am. And it was in this name that Moses carried in as God delivered them from the nation of Egypt. And they would learn these attributes of God. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord my banner. Jehovah Sikhanu, the Lord my righteousness. They would learn, even as Abraham would go up on Mount Moriah and offer his son Isaac upon an altar. Well, didn't fully offer him because God stopped him before. Thank God for that. Where he said, my, God, God shall, or my son God shall provide himself a sacrifice. And there they learned some names about God and his attributes. They learned their history. They learned how to approach God. They learned that their sins deserved a, a blood sacrifice. And without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. And they would break all these things down and just be reintroduced into the covenant promises where God says, I want to make your, 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 your seed as the stars of heaven, as the sand upon the seashores. When they saw God deliver one after another, they saw the faithfulness of God. Again, it was a reinstituting and reuniting of the people to the God of their fathers. As the Word of God begins to speak to these people's hearts, if I can say it that way, the Bible tells us uh, over in verse uh, 4, it says, And Ezra the scribe stood upon the pulpit of wood, Let's see, no, it's, it's down below that. Let's, let's see, verse 6. Verse 6. And Ezra blessed the Lord and the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen. You know, even, even the Israelites said Amen during the service once in a while. With the lifting up of their hands, they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And this is tr true worship to the Jewish nation. And Joshua and Bonnie and, and some of the others, I won't pronounce their names because I'll butcher it. They stood in their place and as they read the book and the law, verse 8, of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading, what happened? They began to weep and they began to cry. They began to be grieved. It says in verse 11, So the Levites stilled all the people, saying, Hold your peace, for the day is holy, neither be ye grieved. For all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions to make great mirth because they understood the words that were declared unto them. The people wept. The people wept. I should have underlined it. It's in verse 9. All the people wept when they heard the words of the law. They saw their failures. The failures of their fathers. The failures as a nation. The departure that was made from God. And at the same time they saw the faithfulness of God in bringing them back. One thing that separates religion from a relationship is this. People don't get broken hearted over religion. They just go through the motions. They can go into a church service, maybe at a Catholic church somewhere, and they would appear before them, and they would go into a booth, and they would uh, say whatever they had to say. This is my sins. Go say, say how many Hail Marys, what have you. They could go to uh, a Methodist priest, or they could go to whatever. You know what I mean. But their hearts are not truly broken. A real relationship is when the Word of God hits them so hard. And it hits home right where they are. And they know. They know the sense of their guilt. They know we deserve this. 
It's like Ezra and Nehemiah prayed. He says, Lord, unto us belongs shamefacedness. Lord, unto us belongs confusion. Lord, unto us belongs this grief because we have failed. And Lord, please forgive our sins and please accept us. When they hear the words of the law and everything that God had promised and everything that God had done for the nation, this is what is going on. Their hearts are broken. And I believe it's been a long time since we've been broken. Since we've been broken. Not by trials and tribulation, but the fact that we have broken the heart of God. We've offended a holy and a righteous and a loving God. Nehemiah looks at these people, I believe it was either Nehemiah or Ezra, one of them. And he tells them, hold your, hold your peace. The day for weeping and afflicting your souls and all of that, that's for the day of atonement. It's not for this day. This day is the Feast of Tabernacles. This day is a Feast of Booths. What I want you to do, instead of, instead of mourning and instead of weeping, understand what this day is all about. You've received the law and you see that this is the way we're supposed to behave ourselves according to the law. And God wants to be your people where He would never bring you back to this place. What I want you to do is go back out and I want you to observe this Feast of Booths, this Feast of Tabernacles. They would go out and collect all these branches and build booths just like they did back when they were wandering through the wilderness. Seems kind of odd because they didn't do this since the days of Joshua. Even, even the, the godly king, King Josiah, when he kept the feast of the Passover, even he didn't do this. And they built their booths to understand the faithfulness of God in redeeming them. The faithfulness of God saying, I'm not going to leave you here in a place of failure, in a place of brokenness, in a place where uh, you're just surrounded by the, the effects of your sins. I want to bring you into a place of a permanent dwelling and I will be faithful unto you. It is a looking into the future, a looking into the faithfulness of God to say, I have not forsaken you. Folks, I think the joy of the Lord, again, it's not in our resources. You can build all the walls you want to. You can build all the homes that you want to. You can be as rich or as poor. You could uh, do whatever you want with your life and live however you want with your life. But the joy of the Lord comes in the fact of of our relationship with Almighty God, the one who can forgive our sins, the one who can... Uh, accept us. I tell you, the day that I received Christ as my Savior was the best day of my life. Because it was finally then that I knew and understood that God accepted me. Broken. Undeserving. Nothing great about me, but yet He accepted me. And it's this idea that caused them to rejoice and be excited, to rejoice in God's forgiveness, to rejoice in uh, the unity, to rejoice in this understanding. And um, God understands this, you know, in our brokenness, in our sins, in our failures, in our flesh, that was never God's will. That was never God's will. God wants us to have joy. God wants us to be excited about serving Jesus. God wants something, a genuine, real relationship with Almighty God. We can rest in God's promises just as, as Nehemiah and Ezra. Of course, Ezra was reading the law and the people were giving them understanding. The Levites were there explaining the book of the law to them. 
But they understood that they could rest in God's promises. He would be faithful unto them. They could focus on God's attributes. He is almighty. He is the I am that I am. We can go to God in prayer and confess our sins and He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And It's only when we go to God that things can be made right. It's only in God that we can be truly accepted. And we need to be thankful for God's goodness and count our blessings. So, I don't know how else to explain the joy of the Lord to you. Have you, have you known the joy of the Lord? The fact that God would use you, to live in you, to forgive you. It's an amazing thing. Let us close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for tonight. And Lord, I'm excited that we can have joy. Joy that doesn't flow from circumstances. Joy that doesn't flow from what I have. But our security, our strength, our refuge is found in you. You're the source of all joy. You are our joy and rejoicing. You're the one that, as we could say as the Apostle Paul, uh, you know, even when he was beaten and battered and bruised and in prison, he could say, rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say, rejoice. Lord, help us to have. Help us to know. Help us to comprehend this joy of the Lord, that we might live in unity and strength, having understanding of the Word of God, once again being broken by the reading and understanding of Your Word. Help us to submit ourselves unto You and be excited about the future. Lord, we love You. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let us stand to our feet. We sing hymn number 278. Jesus is calling. Jesus is tenderly calling thee, Lord, calling today, calling today. Roll farther and farther away, calling today, calling today. Jesus is tenderly. Let's sing verse 4. Jesus is pleading, no list to his voice. Hear him today, hear him today. They who believe on his name shall rejoice. Quickly arise and away. Calling today, calling today. Jesus is Tenderly calling today. Amen. Well, I'd say go home and uh, read the chapter and think that through and uh, see the glory in it. Brother Ed, would you close us in a word of prayer, brother?